multiple generations and completely different phases of motorsports has all lived through this building. Back in the day, these were for the drag racers. Our dome had a shop in the end. Gurney Eagle engine. There's, there's an offie. We did some offies, but basically we did the Cosworth DFX engines. Those pictures have been up here since probably 1970. Well, when the day comes that this is not a bus stop, so we're standing here in Van Nuys, California with Ed Pink, Lake Speed Jr. Ed is about to show us his historic engine shop, which won't be here for that much longer. What's about to happen to everything here? Well, uh, the city is going to take over all this property here, and it goes from Van Nuys Boulevard to Sepulveda. The Olympics are coming here in 2028, so they're going to turn this all this property into bus terminals. We were given notice that uh, we're going to have to move. So far, they haven't given us a date yet. We're looking for a building uh, where all this is going to go into, but right now we're still at the original place. How long have you been in this building? Since 1965. Wow, 65. Yeah. So all the top fuel stuff, all the Indy car stuff, all the sprint car stuff, all, all the tour. road racing Porsche stuff, all that was built here. Yep. There's a lot of history here. Want to go see it? Yeah. yeah. Let's go. I want to see it. Are all these cars on the wall things that you've had involvement in? All the, all the pictures on the wall are cars that, that this company has built engines for over the years. Huh, wins. Yeah, I know, it's too funny, right? <laughs> and Jimmy's in here, he's the general manager of the company. You got the modern office. He, he's got my office, which I don't want anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tom, he's the parts man. He's the one that How you doing? Up. He handles all the parts. There's more pictures in here. Who's the picture frame manager? There's a lot of those. Originally, <laughs> <laughs> it was my wife that did, did it. But uh, now it's up to Tom and his group to take care of it. This picture right here is the second SEMA show at the I'm Convention Center. Oh, yeah. That we had a booth in the show, and that's a picture of our booth. The second SEMA right. ever? Yes. The first one was at Dodger Stadium. And then the next one was at the Anaheim Convention Center. And huh. that's where that's at. Is this you in these pictures up here? Oh yeah. That's me, yeah. That's, that's awesome. That was our first dino that Vic Elrock lent me. Oh really? Yeah, I, I didn't know. Vic Senior. Vic Senior. We like to throw in old pictures along with the new stuff to kind of show you what it was like. I don't think we're gonna have to do much of that here because everything looks kind of like it's a time capsule. It's really cool. This is our engineering room. When anything gets to be drawn or uh, designed, it's done in here, in the computer. 3D printer in an office with vintage paneling. That is awesome. Yeah. It's about as good as it gets, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, we're, we're pushing for this paneling to make a comeback. I like it. Where are we going now? We're going in the engine department. This is this department, and over here is the assembly. And all these carts. Hi, Bill. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. All these carts represent a engine. So these Porsche engines? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some of my, yeah, that's a Porsche. That's going to the Singer company. Uh, the company does all the rebuilding of all the Porsche engines for Singer. Here's one of our Toyota midget engines. So this is a current race engine? Yeah, that is the current. These like the Chili Bowl car engines? Could be. Mm-hmm. Are these the same engine stands from the second SEMA show picture? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is historic stuff right here and it's still being used. These are various engines that are done or waiting to be done. There's, there's an office. What era is this from? This would be from uh, the 60s, 50s and 60s. So is this the 50s, 60s IndyCar engine? Yep. Is that what this is? It could be, yeah. This is our QC room where every part we get goes through this department. Any part we make goes through this department. And it's all coordinate. Uh, this is a CMM machine which measures every dimension of the part. And then we have a granite table with height gauges and so forth for measuring. Was this a QC room before there was equipment like this to do QC with? It was a, it was a QC room to start with and most of the measuring devices we had were hand devices were as uh, 
our business got better and the, and the technology got better, we were able to get machines like this to do it. Where when we, when we measure a part, every measurement of that part goes into the computer. So we can look at it a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. And th this room is our catalog room. Uh, when parts come in, they end up here. And then from here, they go into the QC room to be measured and checked. When we first started, when I first started this business, this was my office. Okay. That's, that's, that paneling there was on this wall, too. So this, <laughs> this was my office. Where was your desk at? Right where you're standing. Right here. This is where you did all your... No, my chair was here and the desk was here where I looked that way. So this is where the magic happened, right here. All your phone calls and yeah. letters and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess it was letters because there were no emails back then. No, there was no emails. No, that's for sure. This this is when we did the Infinity in the engine, and this is the pan we designed for it, and this is the water pump with the oil filter assembly, and this is a dry sump pump. And y'all manufactured all of this here, we right? We made every piece here. Yeah, everything was made here. And we had this as a display so that uh, we could show people. That's crazy. I feel like I say the same five things every time we see something neat, but I, kinda, I don't know what else to say. Should I just say nothing and then you think I don't care? Or should I, just, I don't know. People watching this stuff are like, you say wow a lot. I, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to say wow about. There's a lot of wow moments, exactly, yeah. yeah no doubt. Well, I, I do know this is a true story, right? That. I remember one day Ed called me when I was still working at Gibbs and we had the oil thing. You ordered some XP1, which is a 520. You ordered some XP3, which was a 1030. And you ordered some XP6, which was the 1550. And I was like, all right, what, what you doing with all the different those? And he's like, well, I have three different types of customers. I've got the guys like the Steve Lewis's of the world with the nine racing that would preheat everything and do everything right. So you could yeah. build the engines with tighter clearances and you could run the thinner oil to make more power. Right. But then you had some other guys who were, they would do that some of the time, but not mm -hmm. all the time. So you had to make those engines a little bit looser, so you had to run the 10W30 for those guys. But then you had the other guys like, I don't know who these people are, they're new to it, they're probably not going to do anything right, so I got to build in safety margins, so you got to make everything looser, so you got to run the thicker oil. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that this guy taught me, is that you, you got to think about the customer and the environment you're going in, and just not think about, well, what's the trickiest best piece you got to yeah. think about it as a system not individual components yeah what's this um, back in the drag racing days we built our own superchargers and this, this is a rotor out that uh and we machined the grooves to put teflon strips in to help it seal did you have to change these strips out every now and then yeah usually about every 10 12 runs you got to change the strips huh and they just peel out and new ones slide in. Because the groove is a dovetail groove. I, mean, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, but the, for anybody watching, the dovetail means that the, the top part, it goes, it's wider as it goes in. That it's way like, it doesn't come like off top. This. Yeah. And then on, on the leading edge, we have a nanotron strip. That's what, that's what seals it. So this seals to the case and right. this seals to the other rotors. Right. Okay. Right. You really did everything in here. Yes, Through man. multiple generations and completely different phases of motorsports. It's all lived through this building. That's the parts room. There's another parts room. It's locked. I don't, I don't know why, but. And then this is a parts room and we have a skin packing machine. Did you build this building or did you buy it and move into it? I bought it and moved into it. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, vacant and uh, a good friend of mine, Harry, my name is Harry Hibbler, who's also a racing person, is a building contractor and he built all the rooms. Huh. So the floor plan the way it is now is how it was for you since day yep, one? Yep, yep. Do you know what this place was before you moved into it? Yeah, it uh, was a hot rod shop. Really? Yeah. On this side was a hot rod shop, and on the other side was a moving company. Hmm. Do you know when it was originally built? 1961. 61. So it was only a few years old when you moved in? 
Yeah. Okay. I used it in 65 and it was built in 61. When did you start getting into CNC stuff? Uh, Looks like the first machine you ever had. Is out in the back, I'll show you. Just think about all the all the things these workbenches have seen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Lots of work. Yeah, we, we built these workbenches. Jaguar V12. Yep. You really never know what you're going to see in here. Well, uh, we, we do a lot of machine work for other other builders, other companies, not just our own. This Bridgeport mill is a, is the first one that I bought. This one right here? Right here. From the first Bridgeport. First Bridgeport, yeah. Did you retrofit the CNC stuff on oh, yeah. afterwards? I didn't have a CNC stuff. It didn't have that to start with. It was just a basic mill. It was like 1968 or 60, before 1970, 68, 69. Well, I think it's cool is that you know, we were at comp for the tour over there and Billy showed us all the machines, all those Akumas they were using to grind cams. Mm -hmm. Same camp, same company. I did not know Okuma made the big old school manual ones like this either. I had no idea either. Yeah. I've, every Okuma I've ever seen has been a new white CNC machine. Now, now these, uh, I think that one, I bought it in... Uh, Probably 1980, 79 or 80, when I bought that one. And then that's, this mill that Johnny's working on now is the second mill I bought. And then uh, we were doing a lot of drag race stuff, so we were having to machine the blocks. Mm -hmm. So we bought that spacer. Uh. Those two spacers. Huh. So we did. That we can take a V8 block and stand it on its end to machine the front or the back of it. Oh, nice. Okay. This is our magma flux and cycle. Every, every part of an engine that we work on goes through this room. This magma flux machine will check cracks on steel parts, and this one is for aluminum or magnesium. The different machines use a different compound to cling to the cracks? Yes. I just like these stairs. Nice, good, low-profile stairs. I'll have to take note. <laughs> Here he built the stairs. He built all the, all these rooms you see. This friend of mine built them all. This is our grinding room. For anything dirty that goes on, there's all the various grinding machines. And this is the cylinder head get ready room. This is where all the jobs are here that, that are done, getting done, or in the works to get done. How long did the gray paint last in here before it got worn out? Oh, well, that's probably been worn out for 20 years, <laughs> at least. Old school double steel decal. <laughs> <laughs> this is more fabrication with a glass beater. The saw, even the arc band saw. How old is this welder? Uh, probably, uh, I think we got that welder in 1970 <laughs> or, or earlier. Man. Yeah, think of all the cylinder guys that already welded up with that thing. Yeah. Well, back in that day, uh, I had a full-time fabricator work for me. Uh, Pat Foster was one of them. Mm -hmm. He was really good. He was, a, he was a drag race driver. Okay. He was a good driver. He built cars, but he was a tremendous fabricator. And he worked for me for quite a few years here to build whatever oil pans. Okay. Yeah. Anything we needed to need to fabricate it, he would do. So then, all in that same welder. How often does that thing break down and have to get fixed? I think it's only been fixed two or three times that I know of. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Old school quality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of built the last stuff in this building. It might be the size of a, I don't, I don't even know, a refrigerator, but if it doesn't break, maybe it's worth it. <laughs> Look ahead. This, this is dino is going through a configuration stage right now with all the new. pumps and lines and all that. This one should be ready to operate probably within, within the next two or three weeks. Is this the room where the dyno that Vic Edelbrock loaned you was? No. 
No, I'll, I'll show you that room. This, this is the room that uh, Ed Brock lent me to dino. It's in right in here. And the house went right out there. The first dino we had, me, he lent me, was a Clayton. Okay. Which was basically a dyno built for Ford Motor Company to test the big truck engines. It only turned into 2,000 RPM. How did you modify it to? We put a gearbox in it hmm. so we could reduce the speed. I think <laughs> there may be some pictures of it here. But this has all been modernized now. It's got all the latest software and so forth. But back, back in the day, uh, The end of this wall right here, there was a wall that came out here to about this this distance. And on this wall were two flow meters. And then in between were various gauges. And when we'd run an engine on a dyno in those days, I'd have three guys in here reading the gauges. So when we get done with the run, I look at them and they tell me what they read and I write it down. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and, and now you have this thing. <laughs> now, then, then we went that from that stage. Uh, we went and up on that wall, from that end all the way down to the end of the window, was a panel box up there with all the gauges in it, and uh, the gauges were all digi digital gauges, and. Uh, my engineer that I had working for me, uh, he figured out how to lock them. So what we, we had a button on our, we didn't, none of this was here. And we had a console here and we had a button on it. And you run the engine and when you're ready to record, you push the button and it locks all the instruments. How cool. And then you said, you, you write them all down. Hmm. And then when you get them all written down, you push the button and it releases them and then they're, they're floating again. And then when you run the engine at full throttle, and you, you say you're going to hold it for 20 seconds, you count 20. At the end of 20, you push the button, and it locks everything. Huh. So that's like the evolution of data acquisition. That was, that was the start of it. Yeah. 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 And then then finally we ended up, today we ended up with this, where, you know, we got cameras in on the engine so we don't have to have somebody in there watching to make sure something don't go on. See, we got cameras. So when the engine's running, we can, somebody can physically watch it if something all of a sudden there's an oil leak or a water leak or mm -hmm. smoke starts coming that you can't see from here. When did you eventually get a, a, a whole digital setup like this that would allow you to play back the pole and see every parameter? When did that actually happen? This happened probably, uh, say probably 2002, 2003, right in there is when we started getting all the fancy stuff. Interesting. In fact, all the all the various variations of the stuff that we had, they still have here. They're up in a balcony someplace. <laughs> well, nobody cool. wants it because once we're done with it, we're going to the next step. So who's wants you know who wants yeah. the, the first step? And here's here's the picture. That's cool. Yeah, it is. Here's the picture of the dyno with the only supercharged engine we ran on. The only one. Oh, yeah, we had we had a customer that ran a bone alcohol car, mm -hmm. and we built the engine for it, and we decided we could have run it on a dyno. It's just the supercharged alcohol, 426 Chrysler, and that thing it made uh, at 5,000 RPM it made a thousand horsepower. <laughs> it, when you ran it, the, the room shook. So I said, uh, no way am I going to run anymore. I don't want to blow my dyno up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we ran the one, and that was it. So in the old days, with the funny cars and stuff, you never dynoed oh, those no, things? No, no, I wouldn't. No, cause those even engines, back then? Yeah, because those engines, even then, I'm sure they were around 2,500, 3,000 horsepower. Yeah, and there was no dyno in the oh, world no, that could no, do it back then. No, it would, it would never hold it. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That's quite interesting. <laughs> Do you ever have any catastrophic explosions in here? Send parts into the wall or anything no, like that? No, we've had a couple failures, but nothing of major consequence. Yeah, I mean, they required taking the engine off the dyno and fixing it, but never parts bouncing off the wall. 
Huh. I guess that speaks to the quality of the builder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's extremely successful to never have that in all the time of being here. All right. This is the teardown room. And uh, unfortunately, the fellow that works here is sick, so he's home today. But uh, any engines that come through here, they get taken apart. You know, I dug, and uh, all the parts get washed. And then they go into the Magnaflex department, they get crack checked. And then these shelves here are uh, shelves of parts. Most of the parts are parts for bygone days, vintage stuff. Like unopened uh, Some stuff? Some of them could be. You know, they're just uh, parts that we, you know, up there's a fuel injection manifold for a Chevrolet. You don't want to throw them away because sure as heck, the part you throw away, somebody will come in with an engine and leave that part. <laughs> what is this? Is this a flat 12 cylinder? Oh, yeah, that's a point. Uh, uh, I think that's a. Uh, that a 918 uh, engine? No, I think it's a. Uh, 917? 917. 917. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, some of them were turbocharged. So they. They made, a th they made a thousand horsepower. Yeah, back then. Back then. Back yeah. The I never knew that existed. So they basically just made a block that stuffed two of their boxer engines together to have a 12 cylinder. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. Huh. It was a Lamar car, right? They did that yeah, for Lamar yeah, to win yeah. 24 hours? Yep, yeah. 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 And it's just sitting here. It's the car that looks <laughs> like uh, Racer X's car from Speed Racer. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the one. It's like the big swoopy looking thing. Yeah. Yeah, with the engine in the back, and it's got the they actually go straight down. The air goes straight down into it. Huh. Yeah, it's crazy. Must have been difficult to air cool a 12 cylinder. Man. I think Mark Donahue. It was a Sunoco. Was one of the ones that was sponsored. Did Mark Donahue drive that car? I think Ed. Yeah, he did. That was a Cosworth engine. Just more parts. Let's see the plenum up on top from the IndyCar day. Wow. Yeah, IndyCar stuff's cool. I'd like to mess with an Indy engine someday. What is this here? What air is the that Cosworth that's from? A, that's a uh, DFX. That's from uh, uh, my air, probably 78 to 80, 77 to 80. Your era is hard to discern because you're, you're kind of... Your era is all of it. I know, but <laughs> in IndyCar, that IndyCar, that Cosworth engine, that's my era. How much power did these make? Uh, well, it depends on the boots, but basically they were about 700 horsepower. But see, the thing is that when they first started running them, they were running uh, un unlimited boost. So they'd make a thousand horsepower, hmm. and a, as uh, things go on, they keep trying to slow it down. And they always pick on the engine to slow the car down, and the best way to pick on it is to lower the boost. You see, at one time they they could run unlimited boost, which means they could run uh, hundred inches of boost, and then they started dropping it down. Uh, when I got involved with it, they were running about eighty inches and then it dropped it to 70. Then they dropped it to 50. And when I left, they were at 40 inches of boost because the engine, the cars were so good and the engines were getting better and better, they didn't need that much boost. It went to 12,000 RPM with the engine. I wanna see some more of that IndyCar stuff. Let's see if there's anything cool back here. I don't know if there's any IndyCar stuff here. Is that an Offy head? No, I don't think so. No, I'm not sure what it is. It could be a Ferrari head. I guess you never know in here. Yeah, in here you never know. <laughs> you know, talk about how his broad his career is. When I first met him, he was at Concord for one of the USAC midget races, yeah. and that was like in 2005 or six, somewhere around there. Yeah. He's still going to the racetrack. 40 years after you started all this, you're still going to the racetrack, yeah. still yeah. tuning on those things. <laughs> Up here is a lot of indie stuff. There's the intake manifolds that we made. 
Well, the GoPro overheated, so we had to let it hang out in the fridge for a little bit, but we're back now. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> There's too much information yes. for the GoPro. It's too much epic stuff. It was melting down. Wait, now, Ed, tell him what's that thing back in the corner back there. That back there is the first wave I ever bought. Really? That's, that's a wave that I probably bought in 1960 or 61. So you bought that when my dad was born. Yeah. 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 So you were like machining parts for Don Perdome and Tom well, McHugh and all that on that on that lathe. Well, customers I had that. I, yeah, any, any parts we had to make for that was the machine we had. Yeah. And the rest of these machines, this is a, a home for connecting rods. We, we do the pin fitting on this machine. Then this home here, we set up to do the big end of the rod. So we have one machine. It does the big end, another machine that does the wrist in it. Uh, this is a valve machine. It's probably 60 years old. Huh. One of the very first valve machines you quickly made. This is for facing the valves. Still works good? It still works good, they still use it. So in the valve department, they got a, a newer machine that you, you were already in there. What is this Gurney Eagle engine? Uh, that's for a customer. Wow. What's, I mean, what's Dan Gurney like? I mean, that, he's a, obviously incredibly famous driver, but inventor too, right? He was like a yeah. pretty brilliant man. He's a great person. Yeah. That electric motor there, that's a motor for driving the fuel pumps for the pull bench. Huh. Because we built that flow bench originally for drug racing stuff. That would be able to flow the nitro. Yeah. So you had to flow so much fuel, you had to have a giant motor to be able to pump all yeah. that fuel. Yeah. A Dodge NASCAR engine. I don't even know what kind of engine this is. It just says Gurney. Gurney Eagle? It just says Gurney Eagle on it. It looks like a small block Ford. Well, it's but a small block Ford with the, what Gurney, heads? With the Gurney what's like cylinder heads. But Gurney had his own heads? Oh, yeah. So is this an Indy engine too? No, it'd be a road race engine, sports car engine. Okay. The electronics room, this is where we build all the harnesses. Did you get much into doing this stuff for yourself? No. No, no you know, I mean, you can only, as a one man band, you can only do so much. So <laughs> I hired the good people. What would you consider your your bread and butter aspect of this whole process to be versus the thing that you're really not that good at, but you do it or you would do it anyway because you had to? Well, the thing is this, that every project that went through this place when I owned it, uh, I knew something about the project or I wouldn't be able to take it in or know exactly who to have do it. So when I get a project in, I knew the areas that I, my expertise was good, and I knew the areas that I needed help in. And I had a full-time engineer that worked for me that was really good. And uh, he was, he really handled the design of any of the parts we needed to make. And I had good engine people, a good machinist, so I wasn't actually doing the work. I would take the job in and I would have the right people doing it. I would be involved in it, but as far as me doing it, no. I mean, uh, the, the success of a business is to have good people, so when projects come in, you can have them do it, and they do it the way you want it done. They don't go off and left field by themselves. Yeah, we got a whole other video about that topic with your dad. Yeah, exactly. Same it's, thing. it's the same thing, right? Yeah. How did you find good people? You got to really look, yeah. And I, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of good people work for me over the years. And uh, I, I had two people that were my aces. One was my engineer, a fellow by the name of Mike Johnson from England, and the other was a fellow by the name of Larry Ingham. And uh, Mike Johnson came to work for me in 1980, and uh, Larry Ingham came to work in 1981. And Mike was an a engineer, and he was a design engineer, and Larry was just a good engine man. And the, all the 
tough project, uh, projects and they were really good projects and big projects went through Larry and Mike and myself. The three of us were kind of the main people here. Yeah, that was your power trio. Yeah, I had a lot of other good people in the cylinder head department and machining and so forth, but uh, Larry and Mike were my two main guys. Hmm. So was that like 80, 81 when you really started to ramp up because they came no, on? No, that was, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it started really in 77, 78. And, uh, and I got I got Mike in 80 and, and Larry in 81. Yeah. We're going to say something about a building in the back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going back. Yeah. So they make the oil pumps and stuff. Hmm. There's more stuff. And those, those pictures have been up here since probably... 1971 or two. I don't know those pictures are. They've been hanging in that same spot that long. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do a lot of stuff with Blue Max? Yes. Yeah, we did some stuff on them on the, the NASCAR side. On the, oh, when Raymond Beetle had the NASCAR. Yeah. And, and uh, what's his name drove? Uh, Rusty Wallace. Rusty Wallace. Yeah. Yeah, we went to that old building with Rusty. Yeah. Yeah, he's quite a character. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Good guy. Good Didn't guy. Uh, Paul Westfall used to work for you? Bob Westfall. Bob. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Who's that? So, Bob Westfall uh, did Westmar Racing. He's a sprint car guy. He actually wanted Ronnie Shaver's buddy. So, him and Ronnie together did the Shaver Westmar gear drives, which right. are still they still make. This is the CNC shop. And this is where all the oil pump parts are made, any of the specialty parts Doug does. Is this structure going to stay or is that all getting turned all into a bus stop? All of this is all going from that street. Bus there, stop. How crazy is that? Down. Wow. That's just... That's sickening. It is sickening. <laughs> that's, that's our Mary Grichetti. Yeah, you know, as a kid growing up, I loved drag racing. You know, my, my dad was a NASCAR guy. I thought funny cars were super cool. And I had a, I had a mongoose bike, and uh, my favorite yeah. guy was Tom Mongoose McEwen. And then I found out from Ed later on, with one, he built engines for Tom Mongoose McEwen, and that the mongoose actually put the money up to help build the mongoose bicycle company. What were these buildings used for these back were, in the day? The, the, back in the day, these were for the drag racers. Our dome had a shop in the end. McEwen had a shop. Uh, the Blue Max had a shop. Shirley Mulvaney had a shop, but they come and go. And as one goes, somebody else comes in. But over the years, all the top 20 car and dragster drivers, they, they house their race cars here. Was this like a satellite place for them to do West Coast stuff or was yeah. this their home base? No, no, this is West Coast. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. And I want to tell you, and this metal wall you see there yeah wasn't there so this property went over all the way over to the next wall and during winter nationals time or world finals time you couldn't pull in the driveway because of all the rigs that were in there and all the guys back here and the lot here a, they all camped out here it was a circus wow it's a wonder i had kept my sanity <laughs> <laughs> this guy not super impressive for 91 almost 92 years old isn't that amazing? It's a, it's insane. What's I mean, the secret to being almost 92 and still out here? For, you remember everything we ask you, so and far. like, uh, how, how do you how do you do that? What if you got a secret or something? No, I'm very lucky. <laughs> no, no, like you know, drink a glass of water every day at 8 a.m. and eat a piece of toast, and no, like no no rituals like that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it, must have, it helps if your name is Ed. Because apparently Ed is Kadirian. He's what, a 101 now? 101. Yeah, so if you're named Ed and you were in racing back in the day, you live a long time, I guess. <laughs> Are you going to try to beat him for the longest living Ed? Um, I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Man, that's cool. Was that your plan when you had these places back here to have cars in them? Well, originally, when I got the place, this was just asphalt, and I had that building. Now, Remember, I had this side, and the other side was the moving company. And I needed a place to house all my drag race customers. So I talked to the landlord into building this building. Huh. 
So he built the building, they're all partitions. And then the drag racers came and, 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 and at Christmas time, we used to have a Christmas party and everybody was here. I, it, it would probably be a uh, hundred people. Hmm. We had a crap table set up, and lots of food, lots of drink. And everybody was here, anybody you talked to in the old days of drag racing, the old guys, Ask them if they remember Pink's Christmas party. And most of them will say, oh yeah. So in however many years from now people may be watching this, if this piece of land is a bus stop, what do you want them to remember about what we're standing in right now? Let me think for a minute. Well, when the day comes that this is nothing but a bus stop, and they come walking through, what they won't realize is that they're walking over hallowed grounds of one of the best race engine shops in the world. Yeah.